So today, when Allah says, وَالنَّازِعَاتِ غَرْقَى وَالنَّاشِطَاتِ نَشْطَى وَالسَّابِحَاتِ سَبْحَى فَالسَّابِقَاتِ سَبْقَى فَالْمُدَبِّرَاتِ أَمْرَى These five ayat are one passage. And these, this, let me briefly translate for you, and I will purposely make my translation confusing or ambiguous, so you appreciate what the complication is. Allah says, I swear by those that pull as they drown. They pull as they drown. Nazi'ati gharqa. When nashitati nashta, and I swear by those that release completely, completely let loose. Wasabihati sabha. And I swear by those that swim smoothly or swim rapidly, you could even say. Fasabiqati sabqa. Then those that get that march forward and get ahead. فَالْمُدَبِّرَاتِ amra Then those that plan or execute the plan with perfect decision making. This is these five ayat. Now that seems very, very ambiguous. Who is pulling and what are they pulling? What are they releasing? What is swimming? What is getting ahead? And there were tons of opinions actually. And somebody called it out because they got excited. It is in fact one opinion, angels. But there are many other opinions even among Sahaba. So I'll start with that. What could be pulling and diving in? Here, أنها الملائكة تنزع نفوس بني آدم عن عبد الله وابن عباس عبد الله بن عمر ابن عباس رضي الله تعالى عنهما What's their opinion? They say that this is the angels that dive into people. They, they, they drown themselves inside ourselves and pull out our souls when we die. That's what it's referring to. And so if you interpret it that way, the rest of the five ayat are going to be based on this conclusion. Right? So then they're going to say, well, they dive in and they yank the soul out of the sinner. Because when the sinner's soul is pulled out, it's like, it's like pulling wool or like a piece of wool out of thorns. Like it tears as it pulls out. So that's that excruciating experience of the body, the soul being pulled out of the body. As opposed to when nashitati nashta, nasht means movement with smoothness and ease, bisuhula. And so it means that the believer's soul is taken out smoothly like water pouring out of a jug. It just smoothly comes out. And then wasabihati sabha fasabiqati sabqa, then these angels take the soul and they swim up to the skies. And they get ahead and ahead and ahead. Meaning they're racing to, for this soul to be judged. The one that's just been pulled out, it's the occasion of death. And then, فَالْمُدَبِّرَاتِ amra. Then they execute the command of Allah, what should we do with the soul? Should it be blessed? Should it be wretched? Should it be punished? Etc. That's the interpretation, right? That's not the only interpretation. And mind you, this interpretation does not come from the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. وَهِيَ النُّجُومِ تَنْزِعُ مِنْ أُفُقْ إِلَىٰ أُفُقْ عَنِ الْحَسَنِ وَقَتَادَ وَأَبِي عُبَيْدَ These are also Sahaba. And it means they're stars, the ones that pull back. Like you know how stars fall sometimes? A shooting star? They, and they dive and they drown somewhere. And then the rest of the interpretation is based on stars drowning. Then another comes along. It's people that have gone far away from their homeland. And their homeland is constantly pulling at them. And they want to go back home. Or they have, you know, their religions that are constantly pulling at them. And they don't want to leave their religions. <laughs> you see how many creative opinions there are? In, in so many different directions on just one ayah. By the way, I'm not giving you the full list here. I found 39 early opinions on these ayat. And you could make a pretty strong criticism if it's 39 things, then it could be anything. Right? So we're going we're gonna to have to deal with that issue, inshaAllah ta'ala. Uh, it's the bow that pulls on the arrow. And then it swims away in the air. And it ra the arrow races ahead. And it hits who it's supposed to hit. Mudabbirati amra. وَهِيَ الْمَنَايَا تَنْزِعُ nufus, Which is similar. It's the angels of death who take the, uh, the, the, the souls away. وَهِيَ الْوَحْشِ تَنْزِعُ إِلَى الْكَلَى It's the wild animal that captures a sheep and is pulling it by its teeth and taking it away. It's like, whoa. وَهِيَ خَيْلُ الْغُزَاتِ تَنْزِعُ عَنْ أَعِنَّتِهَا or it's the, it's, the, it's the horses of the Muslim warriors, meaning the mujahideen of that day, that are diving into the enemy forces and pulling at the reins of their horses as they dive into the, the, the forces. Or it's the winds that pluck the trees out, they yank the trees out of the ground. You can see that diving and pulling out is any number of interpretations. 
وأشهر هذه الأقوال جميعا أنها الملائكة تنزيع أرواح بني آدم. And the most famous of these opinions, in fact, is that it's the angels that pull back, pull the, pull the souls of the, the children of Adam out. Bint Shatta is going to actually disagree with that. And I'm, I'm, after doing a lot of study and pondering and thinking of my own, I have come to find myself more convinced of her position. I want to start by saying, I'm not saying this is the right interpretation. I am saying that this is the interpretation I find most convincing. You have to do your own reading, come to your own conclusions, right? And that's, that's, and if you would think that one Sahabi's opinion is sacred, then you would never find another Sahabi with a completely different opinion, and yet another Sahabi with a completely different opinion. That in and of itself is evidence that this is an exercise left for all of humanity. And on the note of contemplating on the Qur'an, I want to say a couple of quick things. The Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave us the Qur'an, the greatest teacher of humanity taught us the Qur'an, Rasulullah himself Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You ever wonder, 114 surahs, how come Allah's Messenger did not comment on every single ayah. I would imagine Bukhari, Muslim, Abu Dawud, all of the books of hadith should be full, first and foremost of what? Explanation of every single ayah. So we don't have to have any disagreements, it's solved. Qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, done deal. That would be finished. Because once he gives an interpretation, there's no room for me to say, no, 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 it could mean something else, or it could mean this, or it could mean that. It's over. Our messenger spoke sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But he didn't speak. And there's a wisdom in the fact that he didn't speak. First of all, there's so much wisdom inside every ayah, that if the messenger began to explain the wisdom of one ayah, then the rest of his mission wouldn't be over. Because this word is so deep, it's like oceans that don't come to an end. Second of all, our messenger was given this book. What was the purpose of this book? لِيَدَّبَّرُوا آيَاتِهِ So people, they reflect on the ayat. So they reflect on the ayat. If the Messenger وسلم, did all the reflecting, then what would we do? Nothing. We'd say, we just, he already did the work. We don't have to think about the ayat of Allah. Then the ayat, afala ta'qilun. Why don't you understand? Why don't you apply your intellect? Why don't you ponder? Why don't you think of, and by the way, tadabbur, which I'm translating as reflection, comes from dubur, which means behind. Allah said this. What is, what is behind this? What's the deeper view of this? Let me take a closer look. You know, to understand something, how we say in English, inside and out, you know? Or you said this, well, what is behind what you're saying? You know, what could, be, what could possibly be the intent? That is an exercise Allah wanted human beings to engage in. And what a beautiful, intimate exercise between the slave and the master. The master spoke, and the slave is wondering, I wonder what my master is saying here. Let me ponder. And another slave comes and he ponders. And the slaves, by definition, are humble. They're humble. And they're in awe of the words of their master. So when a slave says, I think, only Allah knows, but I think this is what he means. And someone says, you might be right, but I think this is what it means, and here are my reasons. People aren't going to make up meanings, they're going to think a lot, and research a lot, and, and ponder a lot, and look at the language carefully, and the context carefully, before they come to a conclusion about what they think it means. But you know, everyone has different levels of knowledge, different levels of experience, different backgrounds, and so they're going to see different things. And they're going to engage in that exercise. That exercise is a beautiful, beautiful connection between a slave and the master. That's a gift Allah gave us in the Qur'an. And you know what's happened in so many parts of the world? I can at least speak with confidence of the part of the world that I come from, South Asia. Recite the Qur'an. If you think about it, you might, shaitan might get to you. Because you might start wondering how this ayah applies to your life, and you might be wrong. And if you're wrong, then you're going to be misguided. And you're going to end up, you know, just, you know what, there are people with much longer beards than yours that, do, that, that, that have read people, other people's reflections. Let them do the thinking about the Qur'an. Your job is not to think about the Qur'an. You just recite it and let other people think about it. Because you're not qualified to think about it. Tell me something. When these ayat came, the majority of the, this is early Qur'an, isn't it? Early Qur'an. Early Qur'an, the audience is non-Muslims. They're non-Muslims. Those non-Muslims, if they had the same attitude, this is not for us to think about. This is for some alim to think about. This is for a talib ilm to think about. This is for a student to think about. If you haven't studied tajweed, if you hadn't studied Arabic and nahu and sarf and adab, and you haven't read ulum al-Qur'an and tafsir and this and this and this, until, then you, until you do all of this, you can't be thinking about the Qur'an. 
then would anybody have thought about the Quran? Would anybody, would Abu, you know, would Umar bin al-Khattab radiallahu anhu ever thought about the Quran? You know, how would they have pondered? What brought them to Islam to begin with is the fact that they thought about what was being said. They considered it for themselves. They asked questions. I, Allah says, ayatun lisa'ilin. These are ayat for people who ask questions. When do you ask questions? When you don't understand something. When do you ask questions? When you become curious. I wonder what this means. How could this benefit me? You're supposed to come to the Qur'an with questions. And our assumption that somebody who has studied ilm, somebody who studied tafsir, somebody who studied the Qur'an with a teacher, with a shaykh and got an ijazah, has the answers to the Qur'an is false. All humanity, if all of our minds were put together to study the word of Allah, we would only get drops out of this endless ocean. We have to be humble to the word of Allah. So while you might think what I'm saying is being arrogant with the Book of Allah, I'm actually saying that is humility with the Book of Allah. Nothing supersedes the Word of Allah. No one attempt of any one human being. The only interpretation we will say, you know, we sami'na wa ata'na, and there's no qawl after it, is the Word of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and that's it. Other than that, it's our, it's our genuine, sincere exercise. Ya Allah, what are you saying? This is why we have a, pro a profoundly diverse history of tafsir. This is why there are so many interpretations of the Qur'an. Because people made genuine exercises. And of course there's criticism between them. Of course there are debates between them. And that, that will continue. By the way, this is the nature of knowledge itself. That's the last side comment. The nature of knowledge itself. Scientific knowledge, historical knowledge, the knowledge of any field. If you're in medical school, if you're studying engineering, if you're studying programming, what programming was 30 years ago is not what it is now. People came along, critiqued, refined, revisited, enhanced, you know, and they, they furthered that knowledge. Same thing with biology, same thing with medicine, same thing with architecture, same thing in every single field. Human beings don't say, well, this was already studied, we don't have to revisit it. They go back, ponder over it again, they look at it again carefully, and they discover more, and then they discover more. And this is the study of the ayat. Creation is also called ayat, revelation is also called ayat. The formula by which Allah furthers knowledge in humanity is not different between revelation and creation. It's the exercise of pondering and asking questions. So may Allah Azza wa make us sincere students. I don't want this to be, well, I read this ayah and I feel like this, it says this. It's not just about our feelings. It is a genuine inquiry. But most importantly, if the attitude is correct, this is the word of my master, I will come to it with humility, but I will think about what Allah says. I don't want to bend the word of Allah to what I want it to mean. I want to bend myself to what is what I find most convincing. I, this, is the, this is the nature of our relationship with Allah's book. May Allah Azza wa Jal you know, grant us sincerely, sincerity in our journey to Allah's book. So she says, Rahimahullah, نحن أكثر إطمئنانا إلى تفسير النازعات بالخيل المغيرة دون تحديد لها بخير الغزات كما قال الزمخشري وغيره من المفسرين. She says, what I find most convincing about this, these ayat, the ones that pull as they dive, that's what she's talking about. She says, what I find the most convincing is this is talking about horses that are being ridden by raiders, by looters, by bandits. Back in the Arab times, one village, one town gets raided by another town in the middle of the night. That's what happens. And they get robbed. And how do you, you don't rob somebody on a camel. You don't do that. That's like robbing somebody with a shopping cart, like, <laughs> that's not going to work. You don't rob somebody with a donkey. You rob somebody with horses. You'll come and you raid quickly, you raid their camp quickly, and you get out of there in the dark of night. That's what you have to do. She says, no, no, no. I also, she says, I'm strongly inclined to believe this is talking about raiders that are robbing a village or robbing or, or raiding a, a, a town. And it's not talking about the Muslims fighting in the path of Allah. She disagrees with Zamakhshari and others who said this must be the believers fighting in the path of Allah, riding their horses against the enemies. You know, and she gives her reasons. Because they were so influenced by this idea that Allah swears by something, it must be something sacred or something noble or something honored. And that's why, well, which horse riders are going to be noble? Not the kuffar, not the robbers. 
It's going to be Muslims who are fighting in the path of Allah. And that's what inspired them to say that this must be the Mujahideen in the path of Allah that are being talked about. فَمَا كَانَ لِلْمُسْلِمِينَ فِي الْعَاتِ الْمَكِي خَيْلٍ تَغْزُو And she says, but in the Makkah Qur'an, there were no Muslims with a horse that's going into battle. What are you talking about? When these ayat were first heard, nobody even knew that Muslims are going to go into battle. No Muslim was thinking, I'm going to be riding on a horse, going in. All the Qur'an was saying was, be patient, make da'wah, be patient, make da'wah. The Qur'an was not saying, just give it seven, eight years, you'll be on a horse, watch. That's not what it was saying. So she's like, this doesn't even occur to anybody who was at that time. وَلَكَانَ هُنَاكَ دَارُ سَلَامٍ وَدَارُ حَرْبٍ يَخْرُجُ الْغُزَاتُ مِنْهَا وَإِلَيْهَا there was no land of Islam and land against we have war. There was no Makkah versus Medina. So there's going to be a Badr or Uhud or Ahzab. There was no such thing then. And to say that Allah is saying that this will happen. Okay, fine, it didn't happen yet. But some people are saying, but Allah knew that it was going to happen. So he called it ahead of time. And so he's saying that this is referring to something that will happen in the future. She says that doesn't make any sense because the Makki Qur'an is not about making vague you know, extrapolations about the future, which mean nothing to the people in front of it. It's giving da'wah to them to the truth. And it calls on something from their experience. Yesterday when I was explaining to you, doesn't Allah call on you to observe the sun, the star, the, you know, the, the sun, the mountain, the earth, things you see around you. So she says, when Allah makes an argument like this, it necessarily is biwaqi'in mashhud, something people have seen, something people have experienced. You know, like a good teacher gives you an example you can relate to? That's what Allah is doing. He's giving an example that the entire audience that's sitting there listening should be able to relate to. That's the point that she's making. وَتَوْطِئَةٍ لِلْإِقْنَاعِ بِغَيْبٍ يُمَارُونَ فِيهِ And would the Qur'an really talk about something so unseen that anybody who hears it, even the Muslims will be confused, I wonder what that means. وَقَدْ لَفَتَ الْقُرْآنِ فِي سُورَةِ الْعَادِيَاتِ إِلَى الْخَيْدِ عَادِيَاتِ ضَبْحًا And the Qur'an did this in other places like وَالْعَادِيَاتِ ضَبْحًا That's the example is coming again. Now, What's, what she then argues is if you were to accept this interpretation, which again, I, I'll share with you why I'm inclined towards it, because the, the rest of the surah fits with that like a glove. Like there's no takalluf, there's no hardship in showing the continuity of the message of the surah if you take this route. So she says, يُوَجِّهُ الْآيَاتِ uh, uh, بَعْدَهَا فِي يَسُرُّ فِي, uh, فِي يُسْرٍ وَبِلَا تَكَلُّفِ If you were to take this interpretation, the rest of the surah becomes easy and you don't have to do any creative interpretation to understand the message of the rest of the surah. And so let's first look at how she's referring to this. I mean, this is so much fun. وَالنَّازِعَاتِ نَزَعْ in Arabic الْجَذَبْ وَالشِدْ وَالْقَلَعْ To pull at something. But when you add نَازِعَاتِ غَرْقًا It's actually in the Arabic language. When you pull something as far as you can pull. Like, a, like an arrow that's been pulled by the bow as more, you can't pull it anymore, maximum tension. That's actually called naz'ul gharq. Meaning you couldn't pull it any possibly more. That's the most you could pull it. Okay, a hard, hard pull. So that's the meaning of naz'a to pull. But on the other side, wal gharqu fil asli lughawi bi ma'na rusub fil ma. Originally, gharq actually means drowning into the water. وَيُسْتَعْمَلُوا مَجَازًا فِي إِغْرَاقِ الْبَلَاءِ وَالنِّعْمَةِ And it's also used figuratively when somebody is drowning in goodness or drowning in trouble. Like we use nowadays, man, I'm drowning. Or people say, man, that guy's swimming in money. Or he's drowning in money. Don't we say that? It's the same actual expression figuratively in the Arabic language. كَمَا يُقَالُوا أَغْرَقَ النَّازِعُ فِي الْقَوْسِ إِسْتَوْفَ مَدَّهَا And that extreme is also used. The, 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 the archer has drowned the arrow into the bow. Literally, drowned the arrow means the bow is almost, the, the, the arrow is entirely inside of the bow. It couldn't be pulled anymore. Um, there's some inappropriate examples too, but hey, I'm teaching a Quran right now, so it's all good. Imra'atun taghtariqu nadarahum ay tushghiluhum bin nadar ilayha an in nadar ila ghayriha li husniha. They say in this Arabic figure of speech, that woman drowned everybody's eyes. And what that means is when she walked in, all the men started staring at her and they forgot there's any other woman in the room. And that's, that's how they use the drowning, meaning just completely lost in this one thing. Now, the reason I shared all of that with you. Yeah, sometimes you read things like that and you say, no, no, I'm studying Islam. So, 
غَيَةُ الْمَدْ حَتَّى يَنْتَهِ إِلَى الْفَصْلِ What this is referring to is there, there are horses, it's dark, the tribe, like they're on top of a hill. I will paint the movie scene for you. There's a sleeping village down there. And this, these guys are lined up over the hill and nobody should move yet, right? The horses shouldn't be moving. So what are they doing to their horses? They're pulling on their reins because when you pull on the reins of your horse, what, do you, what does the horse do? It stops and they're holding the reins, holding the reins, holding the reins. And the horse understands that language. The moment you release the reins, what's the horse gonna do? It's gonna march, right? So when Nazi'ati Gharqa is holding the tension as much as humanly possible, and then when we go to when Nashitati Nashta, when Nashtu fil Lugha Yustamalu Aslan fil Aqd Alladhi Yashalu Hullahu. Yashulu Halluhu actually. It's Nashata is used in Arabic for a knot or something that holds something together that can easily be undone. Like if you're not good at tying your shoes and they easily come undone, that's nashat actually. Or anshuta they call it also. And so the idea of something that gets released or softened. In other words, they're holding on, holding on, wait, 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 and all of a sudden, go. And they release it. When nashitati nashta, they let it go entirely. And when, when that happens, what's gonna take place next? The horses are gonna go downhill. They're gonna go and raid. She, so she says about this ayah, about when nashitati nashta, وَنُؤْثِرُ أَن نُضِيفَ إِلَيْهِ مَا يَرْبُطُهُ بِأَصْلِهِ اللُّغَوِي إِفْلَاتًا مِنَ الْعِقَالِ Loosening up of the reins of the horse, to let it go, to unleash it. وَالسَّابِحَاتِ سَبْحَ السَّبْحَ الْعَوْمُ وَالْأَصْلُ فِيهِ أَنْ يَكُونَ فِي الْمَا Sabh in Arabic actually means to swim or to float. It's used for, for boats, it's used for a safina, it's used for a fulk, you know, it's used for a swimmer. And Allah says literally here, and they swim smoothly, or they swim piercing through. وَالسَّابِحَاتِ sabha. And the, the, the maf'ul mutlaq that's been added here, sabihat is enough. But وَالسَّابِحَاتِ sabhan. It's not just a hal, it's also a mutlaq. In other words, they really swim. They are piercing through the water. What this is doing is, وَيُسْتَعَرُوا لُغَةً لِلْخَيْلِ فَيُقَالُوا لَهَا السَّوَابِحِ this was actually figuratively used for horses. They would say sometimes the horses are swimming. You know the desert is the ocean of land, right? And so in the desert, the horses are what? Swimming in that ocean. And you know how the water, when a, when a fast boat goes through it or a shark is going through the water and it's on the surface, what happens in the water? There's a wake in the back. It's like it's tearing through the water, isn't it? When horses are running in the desert, aren't they leaving a wake behind? Aren't they tearing through the land? They're leaving a similar effect as the ocean leaves when a speedboat goes through, or a jet ski goes through, or back in the day a shark goes through, you know, or a, or a vessel, look, a fast vessel of, of uh, you know, make, like a, a boat goes through. So wasabi hati sabha is basically describing this is the kind of thing that you see in the seas, but these incredible animals are showing you that scene on the land. كَمَا يَجِئُ فِي الْقُرْآنِ لِسَبْحِ النُّجُومِ فِي الْفُلْكِ وَكُلٌّ فِي فَلَكٍ يَسْبَحُونَ It's also used for floating or swimming in the air, meaning move, flying. And that's actually similar to when we talk about how, man, that car is flying. That car is flying. So there are two implications of وَسَابِحَاتِ سَبْحَ now to add to this image. On the one hand, it's piercing through the land, it's violent. Like the, like the water is being torn open, as the vessel goes, the earth is being wrecked as these horses go through. So it's violent extreme and aggressive. On the other hand, the speed with which they're moving can be compared to flying. And those are the two intense you know, notions that are added to this image. Now that the horses have been released, it's only natural that they're gonna go super fast, and that's what sabi hati sabhan. The scene is now intensified. And so as we move forward, we're going to see wasab fasabiqati sabqan. Then there's no surprise. The fa here is actually to show that immediately and thereafter, quickly. Now, there's a, for Arabic students, there's musabiq and there's sabiq. Musabiq means someone who races, sabiq means someone who gets there first. Like wasabiquna sabiqun. Sabiqun are those who get there first. The, translated the first and the foremost, right? 
So wasab fasabiqati sabqa means they get there super fast. They get to their destination in no time. Which tells you that they had their target in sight, they moved very quickly. It's incorrect translation to say, and they race with one another. If some suggest that, thus racing and you know surpassing one another. That would actually be be fal musabiqati sibaqan, not fasabiqati sabqan. That's a different, wasn't altogether, sabaka, not sabaka. Okay, so now, now they get there. Now the thing is, this is what I was waiting for. What's gonna happen when they get there? Now, now it's on. Now the scene begins. But before we get there, just a couple of quick things. Malhuzan fihi ma'na sur'a wal mubadara. When Allah says, fasabiqati sabqa, they get there quickly, they get there immediately. Wasti'maluhu fil khayl wadihun wa qareeb. And using that for horses is so obvious. وَذَهَبُوا إِلَى تَأْوِيلِ السَّابِقَاتِ إِلَىٰ أَنَّهَا وَصْفٌ لِهَذِهِ أَوْ تِلْكِ فَالْمَلَائِكَةُ تَسْبِقُوا إِلَىٰ تَدْبِيرِ شُؤُونِ الْكَوْنِ بِأَمْرِ اللَّهِ Those are the other interpretations you can find them in tafsir. Like the angels are taking the, the souls up and they're racing up or they're, they get there super quickly, etc, etc. She's disagreeing with that and this by the way also existed classically. So it's not just her opinion, she's more inclined towards this opinion. What I find unique about her contribution is she's providing a thorough rationale behind it. She's actually furnishing it with a thought process and a complete imagery that, that makes it holistic.